A pair of binoculars is essentially a handheld double telescope. Light rays from the object you're viewing enter the lenses on the far end, the objectives. This projects an image just behind those lenses inside the binocular's housing. The smaller eyepiece lenses you peer through then magnify that image. The objectives are curved, causing the image to appear upside down. To turn it right side up, each binocular half needs a glass prism. Using UV light-activated glue, workers mount several prisms on steel plates that take them through a series of grinding and polishing steps. Protective paint prevents any dust from contaminating the pristine surface. Grinding with diamond dust removes mere tenths of a millimeter of glass. Polishing with an even finer abrasive removes another one one-hundredth of a millimeter. At the end of it all, the three sides are perfectly flat. This minimizes reflection, critical for making the glass see-through. To make each prism, they glue two pieces of glass together at 90 degrees. This special machine ensures the angle is precise. A shot of UV light dries the glue. The first piece of glass rotates the inverted image 90 degrees. The second rotates it another 90 degrees, completing the flip. Now for the objectives. These curved lenses have undergone the same grinding and polishing steps as the prisms. Now they go through a nine-stage computer-guided cleaning process. After inspecting the lenses, a technician glues two together. A double lens limits a type of distortion that causes fringes of color to appear around the image. It's critical to match them to each other perfectly. If the alignment's off by more than just one hundredth of a millimeter, the image will be poor. This alignment machine displays a dot representing the center of each lens, so it's just a matter of matching the dots. A two-second shot of UV light dries the glue. Next, a technician loads mineral pellets into a vacuum chamber. Their exact formulation is a company secret. The pellets produce an anti-reflection lens coating that lets more light come through the lenses. Inside the vacuum chamber, a beam of electrons evaporates the pellets into microscopic particles that coat the lenses. It's time to begin assembling the binoculars. First, the objectives go into the housing, which is usually made of plastic, aluminum, or carbon. Workers clean the lenses with a few blasts of compressed nitrogen, then secure them in place with threaded holding rings. Now a few drops of glue behind the objectives, where the prisms will go, another blast of nitrogen to remove any dust, then they insert the prisms. This optical machine aligns the focal points of the prism and its corresponding objective. Then some more glue to lock in the positioning. And a blast of UV light to dry the glue. Now they silicone the objectives and prisms to the housing's middle section. Silicone creates an airtight and waterproof seal. This holding mechanism presses the parts together while workers drive in the screws. Onto the opposite end of the middle section go the oculars, the smaller lenses through which you look. Those also attach with threaded holding rings. Now, through a valve on each side, a machine sucks air from the housing and injects nitrogen gas. Nitrogen prevents the lenses from fogging up. A day after filling, they recheck the nitrogen pressure to make sure there's no leak. This factory puts all the binoculars it produces through rigorous testing subjecting them to prolonged vibration, water pressure, extreme heat, freezing temperatures, and other trying conditions. After every test, inspectors make sure everything still works perfectly, both mechanically and optically. The telescope was invented by a Dutch optician four centuries ago. Before that, it was believed the Earth was the center of everything. 
the theory that it actually revolved around the sun was discounted. In the hands of Italian astronomer Galileo, the telescope brought reality into focus. Modern telescopes are light years ahead of those early versions, and through their eyepieces, the universe continues to unfold. A reflecting telescope bounces and concentrates light with mirrors. Production begins with the machining of cylindrical metal parts. These are baffles, and when screwed together, they'll block stray light that would interfere with the telescope's operation. More tools transform a solid aluminum disc into a ring with spokes. This part, called the spider, is a framework for supporting the telescope's secondary mirror. After coating the metal parts with a protective oxide, they plunge them into a vat of black dye. The dye soaks into the oxidized pores and seals the surface of the parts. Next, this molded disc of thick, low-expansion glass will become the telescope's primary mirror. A diamond-edged tool rotates on a calculated tilt to make the glass slightly concave. To improve the concave profile, a worker coats the glass with abrasive. He adds a weight to a precisely curved cast iron disc and spins it. The weighted iron disc bears down on the abrasive coated glass to fine tune its curvature. A worker then examines the finely ground surface for scratches. And using a calibrated gauge, he measures the radius of the disc to confirm that the concave profile is precisely what it needs to be. The glass now spins while a cylindrical cutter aims dead center to cut out a hole. This center hole is sized to accommodate the baffles we saw earlier, and it will also enable the mirror to be held securely in the telescope. Next, the glass disc oscillates as an automated tool rubs a compound against it to polish it. A worker then applies some of the compound onto a polishing disc and works the surface of the glass against it repeatedly. This hand polishing improves the surface considerably. In the laboratory, a technician compares the primary mirror glass to a grid to verify that the dimensions are accurate. He aims a laser at the glass. A computer analyzes the reflected light. If the angle is off by one thousandth of the width of a hair, the telescope's image could be blurry. The glass is now ready for its mirror finish. They lock it face down in a vacuum chamber. They add small amounts of titanium oxide, silicon monoxide, and aluminum. They close the chamber, tightly encasing the contents, and then pump out most of the air, creating a partial vacuum inside. They activate a 6,000 volt electrode. This sparks a glowing discharge of ions onto the now rotating glass disc. These ions blast any lingering contaminants from the glass to give it a serious cleaning. They heat the aluminum, titanium, and silicon pellets, which evaporate into a cloud of vapor. Atoms condense, landing on the surface of the glass to form a glossy mirror surface. It takes just minutes for this highly reflective coating to be applied. This telescope mirror is now ready to reflect light from the stars and planets in the sky. Next, a technician screws lenses into the metal housing for the primary mirror. He adds a mount mechanism for the eyepiece, complete with knobs for focusing. He flips over the assembly and slides that precision-made mirror onto the housing. A cork ring cushions the mirror so a retaining ring can be installed without a scratch. The telescope's primary mirror is now secured to the housing. He pieces together the three-part baffle, then screws it to the lens holder protruding from the center of the telescope mirror. He joins the baffle and mirror assembly to the telescope tube. The tube has already been equipped with a secondary mirror that will bounce reflected images from the primary mirror back for magnification and viewing. It's taken about six weeks to build this telescope, and now it's ready to help unravel the mysteries of the universe. The space pen can write in zero gravity, which is why astronauts have used it. It also writes underwater in extreme heat or cold, or when held upside down. 
All this is possible due to the pen's ingenious design that keeps ink flowing toward the tip no matter what. The space pen's ink is pressurized with nitrogen, so unlike ordinary ballpoints, it doesn't rely on gravity to flow toward the tip. Invented in 1966, the pen first went into space with the Apollo 7 astronauts. The pen's writing point starts out as a three-tenths of an inch long block of stainless steel. It passes through more than a dozen machining operations that progressively shape a point, then bore a hole through the tip to form a pocket for the carbide steel ball. That makes this a ball point. The last station inserts the ball and curves the edges of the pocket inward so that the ball is locked in, yet can rotate to spread ink. The replaceable ink cartridge, called the refill, begins as an empty brass tube. This assembly machine inserts a white plastic ball into the back end, then pumps in half a gram of ink. The white ball is called the float. Its job is to follow the ink down the tube, moving residual ink forward toward the point. Next, the machine inserts the writing point into the opposite end of the tube. Then it crimps the end to ensure the writing point can't dislodge. Back to the other end of the tube now, the machine applies a bit of sealant, injects nitrogen to pressurize the refill, then caps the tube with a hollow brass plug. Nitrogen is ideal for pressurizing because it's an inert gas that doesn't harm the refill tube or its contents. This demonstration shows how the pressurized nitrogen forces the ink flow. After subjecting each and every refill to a writing test and washing the surface to remove traces of machine lubricant and other residues, a printer applies the company name and product information on the refill. Certain space pen models have a cap that fits over the writing point. A feeder places a brass cap on each spoke of the cap assembly machine, which then pushes the cap into position to receive a clip. The clip is stamped out of spring steel, a fairly flexible metal. It's chrome-plated for corrosion resistance and aesthetics. The machine drives the clip's teeth through the wall of the cap, then curls them back toward the inside of the wall, locking the clip in position. To prepare the two-part brass body of the pen, a feeder drops the bottom part, called the barrel, onto each spoke of the barrel assembly machine. To straighten the writing end, the machine inserts a brass reinforcement piece called the nose tip. It then crimps the end, flaring the nose tip inside the barrel, so that it becomes wider than the barrel opening and therefore can't slip out. This model has a chrome-plated brass body and clipless cap. To begin assembling the pen, workers place the barrel in a foam holder, insert a spring to keep the refill in position, then a threaded connector made of brass. The barrel goes through a machine which puts a silicone rubber O-ring on the top edge of the barrel. And now the final assembly. They place a refill in the barrel, insert the connector into the top half of the body. Then with an electric motor, thread the parts together. After placing the cap open side up in a foam holder, they insert the pen. The O-ring holds the cap in place. The original space pen, still in production, has a push button on top to push out the refill and another on the side to retract it. This demonstration pen has a cutaway section to show the inner workings. All space pen models can write underwater and in zero gravity. They also work in freezing cold, intense heat, and upside down. An aircraft must be able to withstand extreme conditions and stress. So it's critical that the fasteners holding the parts of the aircraft together 
are made to precise technical specifications from high-strength corrosion-resistant materials. This company manufactures fasteners for all types of aircraft. These screws and bolts are made of aerospace-grade stainless steel. It arrives from the steel mill as coil. Certain fasteners are coated with copper, which acts as a lubricant, and the company further lubricates them with powdered soaps and other chemicals. This prevents the coil from catching as this drawing machine pulls it through a round die. Wire from the drawing machine enters this bolt-forming machine. First, it heats the wire and cuts pieces called blanks. Each blank then passes through five different dies, each of which progressively shapes it into a bolt. This T-bolt is made from a different type of high-grade stainless steel that doesn't require extra copper lubrication. The coil goes through the same process as the smaller bolt we just saw. However, this bolt forming machine is much larger and uses four dies rather than five to shape the T-bolt. All fasteners must pass several quality control checks throughout the manufacturing process. In this particular test, the factory measures the bolt's head length and diameter and checks the results against the technical specifications. When the fasteners come off the forming machines, they have sharp edges called burrs, so they have to go for a spin in a deburring machine. This one is pretty low tech, but highly effective. Fasteners made of certain types of stainless steel are sent to an outside plant for heat treatment, which strengthens them. Fasteners made from copper lubricated stainless steel soak in a bath of nitric acid for about 20 minutes to dissolve the copper without harming the stainless steel. Workers thoroughly rinse the fasteners with water, then dry them off by spinning them at high speed. The final step is to form threads on the body of the fasteners. Forming threads adds even more strength. That's because this factory does that using a process called thread rolling. Rather than use machining equipment which cuts threads into the shank, a process that removes steel and can weaken the bolt, this thread rolling machine rolls one bolt at a time between two dies, which forms the thread pattern. This process doesn't remove any material and compressing the steel to form threads actually increases its strength and ability to handle stress during flight. The threads undergo a thorough quality control inspection. A technician uses a precision gauge to measure them. Next, he uses ring gauges. If the fastener screws into the no-go gauge, the dimensions are wrong. If it screws into the go gauge, they're correct. This optical imaging system measures the fastener, analyzes the form, spacing and angles of the threads, then sends the data to the company's computer system. That system can trace every single fastener back to the batch of steel from which it was made. Another quality control test measures tensile strength how much pull force the fastener can withstand before breaking. In yet another test, technicians cut the fasteners into pieces, mount them onto a bake-like puck, and polish them. Then examine them under a digital microscope. Among other characteristics, they analyze the steel's grain size and structure. This type of stainless steel has a high nickel and chromium content, making it resistant to extreme temperatures and corrosion. Another test assesses how hard the steel is according to an international standard known as the Rockwell Hardness Scale. Such rigorous testing is imperative for safety, as these fasteners are what hold aircraft together. <laughs>